The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Exodus chapter 31, we're looking at verses 1 through 6. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Full-Time Christian Work. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. Once more we worship thee, praise thee, and acknowledge that thou alone art our God, and there is none like unto thee. In this hour speak to us in thy word, and use this study to build us in the knowledge of thy truth, so that we may know thee better and love thee more. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today I want to speak to you about full-time Christian living. A phrase I detest is full-time Christian work, as though any Christian in the world was not to be in full-time Christian work. We need another phrase to describe those who obtain their livelihood by the gifts of other believers. Pastors, church workers, board secretaries, evangelists, missionaries, or whatever classification the worker may come under, let us call them career Christians. But to appropriate the title full-time for them is to insult the multitudes of doctors, lawyers, merchants, housewives, nurses, and all others who are living full-time lives of Christian service for the Lord. For those who gain their living from secular pursuits but do not live entirely for the Lord, the phrase gives them an excuse for not going out full-time for him. A generation ago, Philip Armour, the great Chicago businessman, was once asked what his business was. He replied, I am a witness for Jesus Christ, but I pack pork to pay expenses. That is the only attitude a true believer in Christ may take. You must be able to say, I am a witness for Jesus Christ, but I'm a newspaper man to pay expenses, or I'm a witness for Jesus Christ, I'm a nurse to pay expenses, or whatever it is that you may do. One of the most interesting stories of God's ways of working in the lives of men is recorded in the book of Exodus in the account of the construction of the tabernacle. We read in Exodus 31, The Lord said unto Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood, for work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability, that they may make all that I have commanded you. Some years ago, I was reading a little pamphlet published in England and ran across a brief item signed by W.J. Coleridge of Johannesburg, South Africa. It was a Bible study outline on these two men of the Exodus and contained nine sentences about Bezalel and Aholiab. I wish to clothe this simple skeleton with flesh and pass on some of the thoughts that came as I meditated upon these two men and the work which they did for the Lord. In the first place, these two men were redeemed slaves. They had been born in Egypt. They had known slavery and had felt the whiplash of the taskmaster. They had lived through the plagues which the Lord Jehovah sent upon the gods of Egypt and had passed through the Red Sea after the last plagues and the Passover. If they had not understood the wonders of Jehovah in Egypt, as God says the people did not understand them, they had nevertheless acknowledged Moses as leader in the cloud and the sea when they were identified with Moses. They had been fed with manna and had drunk from the rock which followed them, which rock was Christ. Now, any believer who is to please God must be aware of the slavery which is the background of every one of us who has been redeemed. All through the Bible, the believer is reminded of what he was before God intervened to save him. The psalmist sings, He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth. Isaiah says, Hearken to me, you who pursue deliverance, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were digged. Look to Abraham, your father. 
In the New Testament, we are reminded that the Lord came to seek and to save that which was lost. And we sing, I was lost, but Jesus found me. We are told that we are now alive from the dead, that we had been bond slaves of sin, and that we were children of disobedience, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Oh, how much each believer is like Bezalel and Aholiab. We have the common background of slavery. The fact that we were once in the horrible pit marks the tempo of the song which he has put in our mouth. Robert Murray McChain, I believe it was, who said, In my study, before I go into the pulpit, I always take a turn up and down in the midst of my sins, and then I look away to the grace of God. And this is what we must do day by day if we are to serve God properly. We must look backward to the slavery out of which we were taken when he saved us. In the second place, these two men were divinely called. And this applies not only to those who are in the ministry and the mission field, but also to those who are at home. It takes as much of the call of God to be a plumber, a plasterer, a doctor, lawyer, housewife, nurse, as it does to be an evangelist or a Bible teacher. How often Christians forget the sovereignty of God in their lives. If you are a man, God planned for you to be a man. If you are a woman, God planned for you to be a woman. If you're five feet two or six feet four, God planned it. If you're blonde, brunette, or bald-headed, God planned it. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. If you are deaf or dumb or blind or seeing, God has planned it that way. He told Moses, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? God calls these two men specifically by name. It will make all the difference in the world in your attitude toward life when you understand this great fact. I am called by God to be what I am today. No matter what my past has been or how I have sinned and wrecked my prospects, I may forget the things that are behind, because God will deal with me as from today. He will call me as of today. We read in 1 Corinthians 7, Only let everyone lead the life which the Lord has assigned to him, and in which God has called him. Everyone should remain in the state in which he was called. Were you a slave when called? Never mind. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So, brethren, in whatever state each was called, there let him remain with God. Oh, what a difference it is going to make in your life if you know that God has called you to be where you are today. In the third place, these two men were called from the greatest and the least of Israel's tribes. Bezalel was of the tribe of Judah, from which our Lord sprang. This was the tribe of David, and the lion of the tribe of Judah was the lion of all Israel. Aholiab was of the tribe of Dan, the last and the lowest of the tribes. In Genesis 49, Jacob said, Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path, that bites the horse's heels, so that his rider falls backward. The tribe of Dan set up independent worship with a graven image, a molten image, and household gods. This teaches us that God is no respecter of persons. He will use anyone in spite of his background, because nothing that we have or are can ever recommend us to God. He does everything for us and through us by his grace. It is not what we do for God that counts, but what we let him do through us. In fact, God has said, Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For consider your call, brethren, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. 
God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. In the fourth place, these two men were spirit-filled men. In addition to the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in each believer, God is always ready to fill his called ones with the Holy Spirit of adaptability for the task assigned. We're inclined to think that the Holy Spirit fills a man only for preaching or teaching, for what in the New Testament in one place are called the gifts of the Spirit that are mentioned in the epistles. But the scriptures show that God filled individuals with his Holy Spirit for ordinary tasks. Bezalel was filled with ability and intelligence, with knowledge of craftsmanship to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut precious stones, and to carve wood. Appointed with him was Aholiab, and the two were filled with the Spirit for making the tent of the tabernacle, the ark, the mercy seat, and all the furnishings, the table and its utensils, the pure lampstand, the altar, the laver, the holy garments for the priests, the anointing awe, and the fragrant incense for the worship. God filled these men with his spirit to be engravers, craftsmen, designers, embroiderers, weavers, and to do all kinds of skilled work. If we translate these into the trades of today, we discover that a Christian can ask the Lord to give him the Holy Spirit of textile manufacture, or masonry and carpentry, of furniture manufacture, of the art of the jeweler, the perfumer, the art of the decoration of ornament, the art of tailoring and dressmaking, or of any other craft. Oh, how many mothers have been given the Holy Spirit of sewing for a large family, or cutting down garments for the younger children. How many men have been given the Holy Spirit of their trade? It is certainly consistent with the teachings of the Word of God for any Christian to ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit of whatever industry, profession, or calling is his. The New Testament tells us, whatever your task, work heartily as serving the Lord and not men. God gave to Joseph in Egypt the Holy Spirit of good government. To various unnamed men, he gave the spirit of tailoring. To Moses and the 70 elders, he gave the spirit of leadership and prophecy. To Gideon, Samson, and other men, God gave the Holy Spirit for mighty deeds of strategy and strength for the deliverance of his people. To Elijah and Elisha, the Lord gave his spirit for all manner of wonders and mighty works. To David and Solomon, God gave the spirit of architecture and design for the great temple which Solomon built. To Daniel was given the Holy Spirit of knowledge and interpretation of dreams. Need we say more? Then let us be sure that God will give the Holy Spirit for whatever need may arise in our lives. Remember that Jesus said, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? Then in the fifth place, these men worked in fellowship with others in whose hearts the Lord had put wisdom. The life of the believer is a collective life. No man lives unto himself, and no man dies unto himself. There is no place in the Christian life for a spirit of independence which makes a lone wolf out of any believer. Lone wolves are in the world, but there should be no lone sheep. The Lord's sheep are in flocks with himself as the shepherd. God gives the desolate a home to dwell in. God sets the solitary in families. The individual believer is dependent upon his master, the Lord Jesus Christ, but this does not make him independent of other believers to do as he pleases. In Antioch there were certain prophets and teachers. The Holy Spirit gave the first order, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The church obeyed, and then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. The Holy Spirit worked in line with this ordination, and they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. So you see, the Holy Spirit did not work independently of the believers who were called to do the job that had to be done. The spirit of independence is a spirit of self-will. It leads to schism in the body of Christ. Then in the sixth place, these men were wise-hearted men. 
this great need for common sense in the life of each believer. This wisdom comes from God alone, for we are told not to trust in our own common sense. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. Or as the Revised Standard Version puts it, do not rely on your own insight. It is very easy to secure the wisdom of God. He will not withhold it if he is asked in faith, for he has said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all men generously and without reproaching, and it will be given him. There are two conditions for receiving divine wisdom. The second is to ask for it. The first is to know and admit that you lack it. No man who relies on himself will come humbly to God as a spiritual bankrupt, but it is only to such that God gives himself. What's a hard lesson to learn? Moses, the Bible tells us, was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, but it took him 40 years to unlearn that wisdom and receive the wisdom of God. This we must do if we are to be wise-hearted. In the seventh place, these men were obedient workers. Bezalel and Aholiab were called, and they followed the calling of the Lord. God ended his call with the words, According to all that I have commanded, you shall do. When the time came to execute the work, we read, Then wrought Bezalel and Aholiab, and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding, and they worked according to all that the Lord had commanded. They did not draw their own plans. They did not seek to improve upon the formula for incense which God had given. So it must be with us, not only in our church life, but also in our personal life. God has ordained the manner in which the church should be organized, with spirit-filled overseers and elders ordained in every place, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, he says. In our personal lives, we are to follow the ways which he has outlined in the word, realizing that there will be a constant turning away from our ways to his ways, which are beyond ours, as the heaven is higher than the earth. In the eighth place, these men were persevering. Once the work was started, it was pursued without stopping. In the course of the three chapters which describe the work from the beginning down to its completion, there are almost a hundred verbs of action in connection with Bezalel's work. He made, they made, he cast, he overlaid, they made. There is a great example here for the perseverance of the saints. How much effort is wasted because there is a beginning, but no continuance. You did run well, Paul says to the Galatians. Who did hinder you? And this is a question that needs to be asked of us very often. How many resolutions are made and not carried through? I saw a cartoon of a couple in a restaurant on New Year's Eve. There were horns and confetti and all the rest. A stout wife in a paper fool's cap was being served a large, fluffy dessert. Her husband, looking at his watch, said, Well, you kept that resolution 18 minutes. It's easy to break resolutions, but there are some resolves that are more important and that need following through. The resolve to be more faithful in reading the Word of God. The resolve to seek out the poor and needy and minister them in Christ's name. The need for the church to persevere in breaking over the bounds of its little membership and reaching out to the world that does not know God. Yes, we must persevere. Then in the ninth place, they were rewarded. An artisan who loves his work finds great joy in accomplishment. I've seen a worker in forged iron look with great joy on an ornament which he had beaten out on his anvil. I have seen a woman show proper pride in a meal well prepared and served. Bezalel and Aholiab must have had many moments of high joy as a gold casting was finished, a silver ornament was completed, a fine garment was tried on the shoulders of Aaron and found to fit well. But when all the work was finished, they experienced something better than the joy of accomplishment. There was a day of inspection, and Moses saw all the works, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded, so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. 
Now that blessing did not originate with Moses. It came through from the Lord Jehovah of hosts. We must consider most solemnly the fact that all our work will come under the scrutiny of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether we have built with gold, silver, and precious stones, or with wood, hay, and stubble, the day of Christ's coming and the fire of his presence will test our work to see of what material it is. Blessed is the man who hears the Lord say in that day, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Yes, all of these things that were true of these men are true with us in our full-time Christian living. We remember that we were redeemed slaves, that we are divinely called that we are called from either the greatest or the least of the tribes, it makes no difference as long as we are called from God, that we must be spirit-filled men, that we must work in fellowship with others in whose hearts the Lord has put wisdom. We must be wise-hearted men depending upon the Lord, obedient workers following him, persevering, continuing in that which he has called us to do, and then we shall be rewarded. Yes, the Christian life is a full-time work. It is living a breath at a time. It's facing each moment with the joy of the Lord, knowing that whatever the task, we are under the eye of our Lord who is bending over us with the eagerness that a father displays when his child is taking his first steps. He loves us. He loves us. This makes all our service a joy and our life a full-time Christian life. And our Father, we pray thee that we may know this relationship with thee and that we may make this commitment to thee that will have thee in every part of life and being. We give thee the praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.